You know Microsoft, creators of Windows, the Xbox, and owners of many brands like Skype, LinkedIn, and GitHub. Chances are you've owned or used something by Microsoft. Whether that be a PC you're watching this video on, Microsoft Office, and the workplace or school, I'm sure that many of you have probably played an Xbox or at least one of the many games from the studios Microsoft owns. And if you're a creep, there's a Zune in your house. Microsoft is everywhere. No matter if you like it or not, this tech giant has slipped into almost every corner of the world they could find, and you've encountered one of their many products or brands. But in the late 90s, this wasn't the case. The internet was just becoming a thing for the average consumer, and people were just introduced to PCs through Windows 3.1 and later 95. Unlike now, people didn't have a baseline understanding of tech. To make computers seem more friendly and fun, Microsoft developed a whole bunch of games to bundle in with PCs, and also sell individually. Computer users fell in love with these titles, and this was the introduction to video games as a whole to many. From businessmen to kids in school, people were hooked on these games. Minesweeper was so addictive that Bill Gates himself had to have it uninstalled from his computer due to him not being able to quit. Solitaire was the face of workplace procrastination, and I'm sure it's caused thousands if not millions of dollars in lost hours. Bottom line is, everybody knew and loved these games, so Microsoft, capitalizing on that success, released more games under their name. These collections did very well, so Probably later than they should have, Microsoft hired classified games to develop ports of these titles to the Game Boy Color. Yes, Microsoft had games on Nintendo before the Xbox even existed. While everybody was hyped about Ori and Cuphead on Switch, Banjo and Steve and Smash, nobody seems to remember about their previous endeavors with the Big N. Three games were released. Microsoft Entertainment Pack The Puzzle Collection, Microsoft Pinball Arcade, and the best of Microsoft Entertainment Pack. All of these are downgraded versions of the PC originals and cut some games. They were released in late 2000, so the Game Boy Color was already on its way out at this point. No one talks about these titles, so why don't we check them out and compare them to the Windows originals? Without further ado, here are the weird Game Boy Color ports of these Windows classics. Microsoft Entertainment Pack The Puzzle Collection, released on PC in 1997. In prior entertainment packs, the legendary puzzle game Tetris was a selling point, so how can they top that? They can't. But they sure did hire Tetris creator Alexei Pajitnov to design 10 games. These don't come close to Tetris in any way, but some of them are a fun time. In the Game Boy Color version, four of the games were cut. Fringer, Charmer, Mixed Genetics, and Muddled Casino. So how do the six games we get hold up and compare to the PC versions? Let's find out. First up is Jewel Chase. Right off the bat, this game gave me some heavy chips challenge vibes with all the random objects and tile movement system. Honestly, it's kind of similar in a way, but it isn't a Sokoban game. You play as Glover and must snatch up all these objects and get to the exit. Another red glove also roams the map and will take these objects if you don't get them first. And if he gets to the exit before you do, you get a game over no matter how many things you collected. A cool mechanic of this game is teleporting between different tiles. Say you're on a blue tile and a green one is in the way. Well, when you hit the wall, you'll teleport to the next blue tile if there is one in front of you. This is a very satisfying move to use and maneuvering around the map is quite enjoyable. This game doesn't feel that much like a traditional puzzle game. There are some moments where you have to do some thinking in true puzzle game faction, but a lot of the time it feels like a maze game similar to the many Pac-Man clones of the 80s. I really like the visual style. All these miscellaneous objects and bright colors and random stuff remind me of an I Spy book. Remember those? The excuse not to read? It's not the world's most challenging game, but it doesn't have to be. Jewel Chase is perfectly fine as being a relaxed and casual experience. And what heightens the chill factor of this game is the music. This cart has no right to have chiptune this good. Take a listen. Honestly, one of the best Game Boy Color songs if you ask me. It's always the most unassuming games with good soundtracks, like Pictionary and Marble Madness. With a whole 99 levels, you can't go wrong with this game, and it's easily my favorite of the bunch. Jewel Chase probably isn't for everyone, but it makes for a great time as a Game Boy game. Anyways, how does it compare to the Windows release? Unlike the regular entertainment packs, the puzzle collection is 32-bit and runs in Windows 10. It's so cool seeing software that's over 20 years old in a modern operating system. Surprisingly, I think I might prefer the Game Boy Color port. Let me explain. Well, for starters, even though there is screen crunch, I prefer the smooth scrolling of the Game Boy version to the basically animationless Windows version. I know a lot of people like the style of the games like this, but it never really appealed to me. 
Also, the characters aren't hands anymore. They're these weird, almost Muppet-looking beans with limbs. I don't mind these, but I like the hands better. But probably the worst part about the original is that the music is just awful. When middies are done right, they can sound decent. But when they are done wrong, oh boy, they can sound pretty bad. We get this cheesy-sounding Thief song that isn't even close to the Game Boy Color theme. The argument can certainly be made for this version, but for me, I'm always gonna prefer the Game Boy Color port. 9 out of 10. Spring Weekend is a lot more simple, and man, I just do not like it. What you have to do is spin these bugs or flowers around and recreate the pattern on the right. To score the most points, you have to do this in as few spins as possible. On normal mode, there's only a set amount of spins you can get, so if you don't know exactly what you're doing, game overs are constant. I hate to do it, but I pretty much have to play this one on beginner. I do see the appeal of this game. If something like this clicks with you, you're probably extremely frustrated with the footage. Spring Weekend is just not for me. I'm genuinely horrible at it, but don't find it any fun, so I don't have any motivation to get better. Eh, they can't all be winners. But let's look at the Windows release. An upgrade. I find it controls way more smoothly with a mouse, to the point where I think it might affect the gameplay. Just a hunch, but I think I'm better at this version since I have more of a grasp on what I'm doing. We just sprung ahead the other day, meaning that Saturday, March 20th, will be the first Spring Weekend. So, I expect the events of this game to be 100% accurate to whatever happens in 5 days. If not, this game is not only not fun, but also a lie. 3 out of 10. Lineup, probably the worst game in the collection. So you know Tetris? What if you bought it at Aldi? Well then you get Pentominoes. Okay, I know Pentominoes came first, but come on. When has anybody said, hey, let's play with Pentominoes? Well, if you answered yes to that question, then Lineup is the game for you. It's not a fun game, but it's for you. Take it. Yeah, so the goal here is to make a line vertically or horizontally with any pieces. Once the line is made, all the pieces involved get removed. The thing is, this would be fine, but there are just too many pieces and they all, you know, suck. If they just made it so you could rotate them, it would be so much better. But there is no rotation, and that makes it so you can't plan anything out. And even if you could, it's not encouraged because the way that you lose is filling up the side. So a piece preview wouldn't work. And about losing, once you conclude that you can't place the last block, you can't call defeat and just go back to the menu. You either wait or turn the console off and on again. There isn't any gameplay besides this. All you do is place pieces and the controls are kind of slow, but they work. Honestly, this could probably be played with real pentominoes. Get a friend, draw a grid, spend money on pentominoes, and have your friends scream at you if you try to rotate the pieces. And you would have a not fun time, but a time nonetheless. The Windows release can't be much different, right? Hmm, there's like a sports theme now? Yeah, lineup still sucks. 1 out of 10. Finty Flush. The name is fun to say. Good thing the game is also fun. However, at first it seems rather confusing. There's some spheres at the top, four grids, only one direction for spin, placing is weird. Yeah, going in for the first time, it's a mess. The controls are clunky as hell. I thought at first I wouldn't like this game, but sticking with it was rewarding. After you get past the learning curve, Finty Flush is great. There's just so much complexity, thinking, and strategy involved. You want to fill these grids using a bank of spheres up top. There are four grids you can rotate and slide around. The spheres up top all come in in different arrangements, and you can summon more by pressing select. Filling a grid is way easier said than done. If you don't plan and think about each move, you will fail. Plus, every column can't be accessed. Once a certain amount is piled up, you can only move the cursor so far. So if that perfect piece is just out of reach, you gotta find a way to work in the other columns before you can nab it. This is no casual puzzle game. It requires most of your attention and some hard thinking from time to time. You do have to juggle all four boards and keep an eye on what pieces will work for each. Then more colored spheres are introduced and a board must be all one color to be cleared. Finty Flush is hard but it's a fun challenge and can be extra rewarding. Glad I took the time to learn this one. On Windows, it has this weird aspect ratio. Didn't think Finty Flush had to be ultra wide, but it sure is. I was hoping that the controls would be better on this version, but they aren't. You have to use a mouse to click on arrows and it slows down the game a lot. I'd say the only good thing about the controls is being able to rotate the grid left and right, but other than that, it's kind of a disappointment. It's a puzzle game, so it's not like it could have been that hard to map these things to the keys. So yeah, I prefer the Game Boy Color version. Don't let this take too much away from Finty Flush, though. It is still a great game despite its shortcomings. 7 out of 10. Color Collision. Now that is a title screen. Similar to Jewel Chase, this doesn't look like a puzzle game, but when you look closer, 
It kinda is. I'd call it more of an action puzzler. You play as this wave thing and you gotta clear a certain amount of circles on the board by colliding with them while having the same color as the outside circle. Inside of these circles will have the color you become after colliding. You can pay attention to the surrounding circles and try to optimize which ones to hit first. If you hit the wrong colored circle, it will still disappear but your life will go down and a stick will appear. These sticks allow you to change your color randomly. That might not seem too difficult, but here's where the real strategy comes into play. Every level has these different challenges to do with the sim symbols and the faces in the squares. These are for extra points and going for them can be fun and rewarding. So yeah, like the other games, this one has more depth than at first glance. This game isn't too intense though, so I can get a pretty good flow with it. Beating the whole thing takes about 30 to 40 minutes, but in levels 6 and 7, I found my hands getting kinda cramped because of the rapid d-pad movement. But overall, I think this might be my second favorite in the pack. I like the visuals and music, and the game doesn't take that long to beat. It's replayable and perfect on a portable. Will the PC version turn out like Jewel Chase, or be even better? Well, it's just a better version of it. The controls are smoother, the graphics are nicer, and everything about it is just a little bit better. 8 out of 10. Rat Poker. Finally. Poker. With rats. My dreams have come true. This isn't a card game though. It's just the idea of poker, but with a horde of multicolored rats and rat bubble capture devices. You must line up three or more of the same colored rats. Simple, but effective. Each level also has a different layout. The graphics are alright, the dingy environments in the levels are kinda cool looking, but the rat sprites are a problem. When a bunch of rats fill the screen, they seem to just mush together. It is hard to differentiate the rats and they all become a blur. The controls also seem a bit delayed, but once you figure that out, it's fine. As you progress, new things are added. You'll have to strategize with the new trap layouts and more hands are added for points. Sometimes a rat will have a plus or minus with it, and these will either double or half the points when used in a hand. The game becomes progressively more strategic and it it is way easier to get the hang of than Fenty Flush. It also gets fast. Really fast. Rats are constantly being produced and you must keep up. If you refuse to keep up, you'll lose a game of rat poker. Nothing is more devastating and destructive to the human mind than losing a game of rat poker on the Game Boy Color. What's slightly less devastating is losing on the PC version. Thankfully, the problems I had with the controls and graphics aren't an issue in the original. Like every game, the PC music is gonna be worse, but rat poker is pretty much better in every way on PC. Except the frame rate is a little rough. I guess my Ryzen 3950X and RTX 3080 just can't handle rat poker. It's a shame. Microsoft Entertainment Pack The Puzzle Collection is decent. Four of the six games I think are good, but they all have some flaws. Unless you're interested in the novelty of it, this game probably isn't worth seeking out. The PC version of The Puzzle Collection is available on My Abandonware for free and works on Windows 10 so you can always try it out there for yourself. If any of these games seems interesting, I'd recommend giving it a download. Plus, there are four other games that stayed on PC to play. The visuals look incredibly dated, but I think that adds a certain charm to the game. Maybe not so bad it's good, but more of appreciation of how game graphic design looked in the 90s. So yeah, if it looks like your thing, you have nothing to lose. On to the next game. In late 1998, Microsoft Pinball Arcade appeared on store shelves featuring real tables from Gottlieb. The game had a focus on pinball history, and that's right up my alley. It includes tables from the 30s all the way up to the early 90s. It can show you how pinball has evolved and changed. When this game was ported, it didn't include Humpty Dumpty and Cue Ball Wizard. Ah, that's a shame. I really like that table. These games are actual tables that exist in real life, so so there aren't any differences in gameplay between the two releases. For these five games, I'm just gonna find out if each game is a hit or a miss. So without further ado, here is the Microsoft Pinball Arcade. The Windows release is pretty standard. Menus are stylish and they recreated inserting a coin into the games. The graphics are sorta of impressive for 98. On the Game Boy, things are a lot different here. Just a plain menu, but there's this history section. You got the techno timeline, the backlash history, the trivia challenge, and techniques. The timeline is a brief history of pinball tables. Hey look, it's Rockola. Back glass gallery is exactly what it sounds like. All the back glasses are the machines in this cart. Trivia challenge is just a whole bunch of fun facts about pinball. Techniques are tips and tricks to help you with your pinball game. These aren't the PC version, but I assume they were in the manual. I don't own it physically yet, so I can't see if I'm right or wrong, but if they made all this stuff for the Game Boy Color version, wow. Let's just get into the game. Baffle Ball. Look at this gameplay. Are you baffled yet? 
If you said no, I wouldn't be surprised. This game is primitive with no flippers. This is less pinball and more pachinko. And what do you know, this isn't that fun. Yep, the only reason to check this out is if you're interested in pinball history. The game is 90 years old and it's been 89 years since somebody's wanted to play it. But it is an important game in pinball history and it being playable digitally is sorta neat. Still, it's barely a fun game, so I'm gonna have to give this a 2 out of 10. Knockout from 1950. Way more of a game than Baffle Ball, but still primitive all things considered. We have the incredible innovation of flippers. Wowza! As you've guessed by the title, this one is boxing themed. In the middle of the table, there are these little cutouts of boxers. On the PC release, they are easy to differentiate. There are a few bumpers on the top and a few on the sides, but the main thing is this guard near the drain. The space between the flippers is very wide, but this guard will stop the ball until you hit one of these 10,000 bumpers. Now, I know I said I wouldn't compare the Windows release and the Game Boy Color all too much, but I have to highlight a few of its shortcomings. First off, the physics are a lot worse on the Game Boy Color. It's pretty tough to describe them but the ball just feels fake. The gravity is just off, and it's floaty sometimes, and it can stop moving when it looks like it should. I mean, just look at what happens when it gets stuck between the flipper and the guard. That ain't right. The physics are like this in every Game Boy Color table, so that kind of sucks. Anyways, knockout. Yeah, this one's all right. Way more entertaining than Baffle Ball, but still an acquired taste. Six out of 10. 1963 Slick Chick, Pinball for the Fellas. This table is great. I didn't played it for this video, but man, is it a fun one. There's a whole bunch of bumpers that spill out Slick Chick and they can just send the ball flying. On top of that, there are slingshots on the bottom that can send the ball right back up into the bumpers. This makes for a super fast yet challenging table. There's also a hole in the middle that will drain your ball. So be sure to avoid that. This is the first table in the pack I think can be enjoyed from a modern pinball mindset. It's fun in a way any great table is fun. It's replayable. I kept putting in credits and playing games after I got all the footage I needed. It's simple, exciting, and an all-around great time. 8 out of 10. Spirit of 76. Pinball with America! <laughs> it's alright. Theming on this one's outstanding. This is a beautiful pinball machine. The colors look nice, and I love the Americana look. It's freedom, all right. Spirit of 76 also supports up to four players, which I bet was almost neat at the time. I couldn't get into this one all that much. I don't know, the layout is just kind of boring. I'd say my favorite part is the drop targets. They spell out 1976, and I've always been a fan of those. Other than that, the gameplay is just not that interesting. I quickly became bored because it just felt kind of generic. This goes to show that newer doesn't mean better. I greatly prefer Slick Chick, and that was released 13 years before this one. It's not bad, just not something I'd come back to. 6 out of 10. Finally, 1982's Haunted House. This game is an absolute classic. One of the most popular pinball tables ever produced. And for good reason. The gameplay is excellent. I love this game so much, and it pretty much makes this whole cart worth it. Or themed pinball tables tend to be awesome, and of course, this one is no exception. There's just so much to do in this game. This was the first machine to have three playing fields. You can move between the main floor, cellar, and attic. Exploring the house and bouncing around all the different rooms makes this game just so special. I'm sure at the time of this release, this was just mind-blowing. Having this on the Game Boy Color is pretty neat. If you want to get into pinball, Haunted House is an essential table. Everything about this table is just so good. The graphics, the spooky music it plays, and all the little targets and point bonuses. So many different areas to explore. Man, I just love this game. 10 out of 10. Microsoft Pinball Arcade is kind of neat. It's a great crash course in pinball history, but I feel like that can be a weak point. While it's cool for the historical value, as a game it could be better. Plus the exclusion of Cue Ball Wizard is just too disappointing. There's no reason to play the PC version today. If you want to get your pinball fix, I'd recommend Farsight Studios Pinball Arcade if it were before May of 2018. You see, all the Williams and Valley tables were delisted, leaving only Gottlieb and Stern. You can play Haunted House and Cue Ball Wizard here, but most of the good tables are gone. A good portion of them have been re-released in Pinball FX3, but a lot of them are yet to show up. I may or may not have borrowed a copy of the Pinball Arcade with all the DLC. This could have happened due to 60 tables being unavailable, but my sources are unsure. If you want to borrow the Pinball Arcade, that is completely your choice, and not mine. Anyways, the PC version is also available on my abandonware, but as I stated before, there is no reason to play this unless you're a retro computing collector. The Game Boy Color version is okay. Yeah, it has physics. But if you find the renditions of Haunted House and Slick Chick make this cart worth it, then go for it. The third and final compilation for today. 
the best of Microsoft Entertainment Pack. The Entertainment Packs are PC classics. The games on here are looked on so fondly by many people. As I said in the intro, the Entertainment Packs really did prove PC gaming's worth and potential. Everybody played these games. One of my old video ideas was just going to be a quick review of all the Entertainment Packs. And that research led me to these Game Boy Color ports. So why not get started with the first game, Free Cell? So what's Free Cell like? Well, if you've played Solitaire, it's kind of like Solitaire, but with all the cards facing upwards. If you haven't played either Solitaire or Free Cell, you have no idea what I'm talking about. So here's a brief explanation of what Free Cell is. You have 52 cards that are dealt facing up. You have four cards you can put in these empty spaces, which are known as Free Cells. You have to get all the cards with matching symbols into their stacks. In the main area where all your cards are, you need to move around cards in order to access the cards behind other cards, while setting them up to be moved in stacks in the top right. But you can't just make a straight line for each type of card. Instead, you have to alternate between red and black. For example, you can't have a red 8 and a red 7 right below each other, but you can have a red 8 and a black 7 right below each other. If this sounds like a lot, don't worry, it's pretty easy to get used to. Another thing you have to get used to is the controls. It's kind of clunky using a d-pad and buttons, but once you adjust, it's fun. Most card games feel better when you can use a mouse or touchscreen or play them in real life, and Free Cell is no exception. While it's been a while since I've played Free Cell or Solitaire, I still had a pretty good time, though I never won. Yeah, I'm very rusty, and multiple times I screwed myself over. Also, the music here is nice sounding. It fits the game. Overall, Free Cell is a good time. 7 out of 10. There are three card games here, and the Windows versions are pretty much the same but with nicer graphics and mouse control, so there isn't really much to say. Really, what can you say? They're card games. How much innovation is even possible? Next up, we got Tut's Tomb. I used to know how to play this one. I'm guessing I was pretty good at it. In Tut's Tomb, you have a pyramid of cards and you have to find pairs that add up to 13 to remove them. If no more matches can be made, you win. Kings are instantly removed. I discovered in this entire collection's card games, you can press select to change the color of the table. You can even change what the back of the cards look like in the menu. So anyway, how is this game? Still as fun as I remember. But man, am I terrible. I don't even know how I won all those years ago. This is a math and logic game. There's a timer in the corner and a money bar representing your score. You gotta strategize what's gonna add up to 13. And if you're like me and get the answers right in front of you, yet you still get stuck, then that's a little something I like to call bad at the game. Despite my major suckage at this game, I find it more entertaining than Free Cell. So it's a 9 out of 10. Next up, we have yet another card game, Tri-Peaks. Never played this one before. It seemed too complex. It's kind of hard for me to pick up on new card games, but I think after a bit, I started to get it. Anyway, how do you play Tri-Peaks? So, you have three mountains of cards in the background, and your cards are in front of them. Below that, you have a pile you can draw from, and a pile of discarded cards. You pick a card that must be higher or lower than the current top of the discarded cards. For example, if a king is in that pile, you can either select a queen or a one. You can draw from a pile of cards, but lose $5 per draw. You're trying to gain money by clearing the peaks. I wasn't a massive fan of Tri Peaks, but I had a little fun. At first, I was frustrated and wanted to give up, but I kept trying. After enough trying, I got better at this game to the point where I was having a single ounce of fun. No more, no less. It can be measured. In fact, it just did. I did end up winning, but I still lost a lot of money. Would I play this over Free Cell or Tut's Tomb? Never. This is the worst of the three. That is what I would say if I didn't play the Windows release. After spending more time with this game, I got the hang of it, and I like it more than Free Cell, but not as much as Tut's Doom. This is a quality game, but it didn't really click with me. Still, 8 out of 10. That's the end of the card games. This next one is classic, Ski Free. They can't screw up this port, can they? This is funny because it is foreshadowing. What Amiben said is an example of dramatic irony, because Classified Games, the ones who developed the port, actually did screw it up, which is the opposite of what Amiben anticipated. This port is ass. Welcome to Screen Crunch Slope, home of falling. I mean, the footage speaks for itself. You can't see ahead of you and constantly collide with every object. Controls are also stiff. Turning is delayed, making crashing even more frequent. On top of that, the sprites look like crap. Just take a look at the Yeti. What have they done to him? The Windows version is night and day. Controls are sublime. The graphics are simple and have aged very well. You can see what's ahead of you and play a video game that produces enjoyment. When playing Ski Free PC, I am entertained. When playing Ski Free GBC, I am disappointed at the name of this compilation as I am not entertained. This game is a one out of 10. 
Life Genesis. This is a take on Conway's Game of Life. I would explain it, but it all goes over my head. This isn't really a game, more so a life simulator on the cellular level. There's a bunch of computer science stuff involved in it, and I can't even explain the reason why I can't explain it, so I'm gonna do my best. <sighs> okay. You place blocks, and things happen. Obviously, I can't rate this game because it isn't really a game and I clearly don't understand it. Minesweeper is up next. This is probably the most famous game on here aside from cards. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Minesweeper is fun and addicting. It's a simple game with quick rounds, making it perfect for portable play. In the span of a couple minutes, you'll either end up doing a ton of short rounds or one long tense round. This game wasn't included in the best of entertainment pack. Instead, it was just bundled with windows. The only difference is the playing field. Game Boy wide, computer thin. 9 out of 10. Our final game is Tic Tactics, which is really bad. Tic Tactics is tic-tac-toe with a tic-tac twist. So you have the option to either have your basic 3x3 grid, a 3x3x3 grid, or a 4x4x4 grid. Let's start with the 3x3x3 and the 4x4x4 grids. They're awful. Tic-tac-toe works in my opinion because of how simple it is. And adding extra layers just means you have so much more to worry about, but it's not fun. Now you're juggling multiple layers at a time trying to play Tic Tactics when you could be playing Minesweeper. I bet right now you're writing a comment about how I should just stick to basic 3x3, but then it's just regular tic-tac-toe. And while I have nothing against tic-tac-toe, who wants to play tic-tac-toe on a video game console? Tic Tactics is just not fun. There's no other way to say it. Like Life Genesis, this also wasn't on the best pack. Maybe because it wasn't good. The Windows version has no differences. 3 out of 10. Best of Microsoft Entertainment Pack for Game Boy Color is not that great. Sure, we got all those card games in Minesweeper, but come on. Every console in existence gets a card game collection, and they are pretty much considered shovelware. I just wish more of the better games were on here, but by the looks of Ski Free, they probably would have gotten butchered. Man, can you imagine how Jezball would have turned out? Yikes. Chip's Challenge would have been awesome for sure, but there were some licensing issues with that game. It did originally appear on the links, so there is a handheld color version. The other hits of the pack, like Pipe Dream and of course Tetris, were already on Game Boy as their own standalone carts. But man, I would swap Tick Tactics and Life Genesis for Rodent's Revenge any day. Klotsky also probably would have worked. This cart is pretty much just shovelware. I do love how the game select looks like Windows is running on the Game Boy. The music is also pretty solid across the games. This game is actually pretty damn rare. On price charting, there was only one sale logged, and while it was only 12 bucks, if you look on eBay, those are the only two copies. However, by the looks of it, this game seems to be significantly more common in Europe. Is it worth it? Eh, I'd say no. Like the other games, you have to value the history, but because this game has little substance, the only reason to own this is if you like wacky crap in your game collection. I am the master of wacky crap, so maybe one day I'll get myself a boxed copy. From Europe, of course. And that was every game. Yeah, they are not necessarily fantastic games. I'd say the only thing here you should play is the puzzle collection. Maybe Pinball Arcade if you're into Haunted House. But damn, is this stuff interesting. There are three Microsoft games on the Game Boy Color. That is just such a good factoid. It feels awesome to say that. Microsoft Game Boy Color games. The PC versions of all these are absolute classics especially those entertainment packs. I can't really stress enough how awesome those are. Puzzle Collection runs in Windows 10 and is quite overlooked. This was a look into an oddity in both Nintendo and Microsoft's history. An oddity that includes Tic Tactics and Lineup. Two games I regret playing.